Well, doing some um, some extensive, extensive research and to show you how impactful and powerful hip hop music in the culture has become, this is the first music genre that has transcended three generations. So you have grandparents, parents and children all listening to Jay-Z, all listening to Lil Wayne. So it creates a platform of dialect to where you can interact with your child. Also, um, given some other history, me personally, and some of this is some factual, again, everything I say, I'm sure some of the panel say, you can look it up because this is the age of responsibility. You go check it out for yourself so you can have the information to make that difference. But this generation is more where single fathers, I grew up in, I was born in the 70s, I'm kind of an 80s baby, grew up in a crack era where my parents both were very strung out, long gone on, on that substance. And I personally, I didn't have my parents there, my mother or my father. But I noticed a lot of my friends kind of went through that same, uh, they went through that same period at that same time, or that same process. Nowadays, this generation, with gentlemen such as myself, 25, 30, 25, 30, um, their fathers. I, I have three children, I'm a father, and nine out of 10 of my friends or colleagues that I know are fathers, we're there, we're, we're trying to make a difference. And it's about educating most brothers that I know are trying to educate themselves so that they can be there for their children or so that they can teach their children. I think that the solution again becomes responsibility in us learning or understanding the game in which we're playing, the rules and the platform of which we have to conduct ourselves. If, you know, Hakeem said, they're making laws every day. You look on the law books, there are over 2,000 laws. We don't know them. You probably know three or four. So if this is, becomes a problem, then we need to get a law book. That needs to become cool, where we know 1,900 of them laws so that we know what to do or know what not to do in those situations. So I think, again, it boils down to responsibility. Um, another thing, again, is us coming together. The unity has to be important. We have to look and get with other organizations, people who share the same ideas. Uh, I don't mean to run off, this is going to be the last thing I want to say. The bankers in a recession, when the financial crisis hit, the first rule in nature is self-preservation. They said, the bankers got together and they said, we're going to save bankers and banking, the banking system. So y'all need to give us this money because we're bankers. Now, laws and economics, it balances itself out. If you did crappy business, then your business was supposed to fail. And nature would tell you, you don't do business like that no more. So whoever stood, they would have stood around or they would have learned and don't do business like that and the financial system would be okay. But they saved themselves. They pitched and packaged whatever they could pitch and package and they said, y'all bail us out. Y'all save us. Chase wasn't ratting out Bank of America. They wasn't ratting out nobody else. They said everybody saved the banking system. And I think that's what we need to do as a people. We need to come together, whatever our niche is, we come together as a community, if it's fathers, if it's mothers, if it's whatever that community is and say, this is what we're gonna do, this is the information we're gonna get or understand so that we can progress and be productive. So I think again, at the bottom line, or to answer the question bluntly, the solution becomes us being responsible, us getting the information or seeking out the information or knowledge of what it's gonna take for us to compete or move forward within our community, within our system, and within our structure because we don't need it in America. That's what the Occupy movement is. It's us not relying on that system which is giving, you know, us giving up the control to a system that doesn't work for us. Bottom line in America, how you keep score in America is ones and zeros. So if you have a lot of money, then you're playing, you're doing what you need to do. And that's what this game is about in this country at this time. Before Bob comments, um, I want to just note that this event is sponsored by the Hip Hop Union, and it's a governing body of entrepreneurs and businesses who champion for benefits, rights, and respects for hip hop citizens worldwide. Uh, a hip hop citizen is one who publicly aligns themselves with the body of hip hop and represents the betterment of the global hip hop community. So I wanted to make sh sure that everyone know, know, knows that this is an organization that is putting on this uh, particular event. And you'll see fans and things and t-shirts of people wearing I am a citizen of hip hop.
and, and we should uh, give Jadia Butler in the back there. Hey, Jadia. Good job. She put it together. Got this time together. Great job. Okay, so just answering your question, from my perspective as an attorney, as an advisor, as a manager, um, the way, the solution that I I see that I currently um, implement, one is education, obviously. Secondly, I'm a big fan of people creating their own businesses. You know, clients that come into my office, I encourage them to create their own businesses. I'm not really, really, really cool uh, working for other people. I tried that, didn't work for me. So I, I, I am a, a firm believer um, uh, and, and find hip hop to be a vehicle to uh, really teach uh, our community the value of entrepreneurship. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, you know, this is America, it's a capitalist country, it's a capitalist system. I don't really see it changing anytime soon. It may not change in my lifestyle, in my lifetime. So the reality is that we've got to accommodate to what the system is. You know, we have to maintain our values, but at the same token, understand this is a capitalist society. So one thing that I know I didn't get a, a firm grasp of when I was younger is learning about money, learning about finances. Um, I've been turning on people that I know have children to a website called moneyology.com, moneyology.com, which teaches young kids about money. Simple as that, you know? Um, and, and just to kind of like really stress that fact, I remember speaking to uh, a gentleman that came to my office, he was an investor. He's a, he's, a, he's a white gentleman, he comes to my office and he's uh, an investor and he's got a shitload of money. He's talking about stock market and this and that, sorry. He's got a shoot load of money speaking about stocks and all that. And I asked him, I said, well, how did you get into this? He said, well, you know, when I was like five years old, my, my father bought me a stock and showed me how to like look at the Wall Street Journal and understand the stock market. My mom and my dad didn't teach me that. You know, I don't know how many of, if, if, if uh, a lot of your parents taught you that either. But it's really an important skill that we have to get our kids to start learning about now. And I want to note something also that I went to every grade without missing one day, K to 12, I don't say. And I went to college at the University of Delaware. But I'll say this, as it relates to education, when I got out of college, I came out, I, would, I graduated with a degree in English, concentration journalism, and they were talking 19,000, and I was like, come on, man, stop. So I went and worked for a bank, and that might have been one of the most important things that I ever did in that I hated the job at the bank, but it fostered this educate, almost like an education on the job that helped foster my innate entrepreneurial ambition, I might say. But when you're talking about education, it doesn't necessarily mean you go to four years of college. After I graduated, I still had to re-educate myself on technology, the internet, very basic things that, well, things that are basic now, but HTML, Photoshop, et cetera, et cetera. And I sat in borders for many, many hours just to get myself re-educated. So understand that if you don't continue to educate yourself, you will be obsolete at some point in time, especially now where I believe the technology changes every six months or something incredibly fast. Like before, you could be in architect and you could ride that out for 30 years or something but now things change at such a rapid pace that if you don't continue to educate yourself and that doesn't necessarily mean taking a course you will be obsolete and I, I know a lot of businesses my company's been in business for 13 years and we are one of the last still here thank you but, but that's that but the point is that has been because we have continually educated ourselves and, like someone else said, surrounded ourselves with people smarter, smarter than we are. Well, that's, that's a real good point. I mean, especially with music and, and the, the internet, you know, I myself constantly, on a regular basis, I gotta take a day just to read up on what's happening with online and the internet, these different websites. I mean, you, I seriously have to sit down and take two, three hours to read through you know, whether it's Wired Magazine, and I don't necessarily profess to understand everything that I'm reading, but just to get a sense of what is going on in this, in this online, social media, internet world, man, it's crazy. Well, I just wanted to touch back on, uh, <clears throat> you had mentioned the civil rights movement and, and the connection and, and sort of leaving something behind, like what's the next step? And I feel like um, th there's still a struggle for equality um, 
out here. And I feel like, you know, what the civil rights movement was able to do was shine a light on a very dark subject, it was a dark place at that time. You know, they, you know, marching, um, people sacrificing their health, taking taking bottles and, and hoses and all that stuff, and it got shown on TV. Eventually to a point where they said, yo, this is crazy. I don't care where you're from. This is madness. And I feel like um, we have to find our, our, our thing to shine a light on. I feel like there's one of these things, um, and, and the reason why is so our kids can see us standing up for something unified. Because uh, I don't think we have nothing like that right now. But one of the things that I, I, I talk about all the time when I try to get in front of people is, um, to me, I, I, you know, work the music business, so I, I see things from that point of view. You know, maybe you guys can relate. Um, but the artists struggle to get paid. Um, in everybody's contract, um, one of the biggest problems is getting paid royalties that are owed. Um, and one of the biggest things uh, that, that stuck out to me was um, artists I, I work with, still one of my best friends, his name is Mims, made a lot of money for Capitol Records. And uh, at the time, you know, we was riding on high till we got our first royalty statement. And we're like, yeah, we sold about 400,000 albums. Yeah, we did about three or three million ringtones and about another 1.5 uh, digital downloads. We did our own calculator. We was like, damn, we made like close to $15 million. Mm -hmm. You know, our deal, we got a joint venture through a joint venture, so we get a quarter of the pie. And we gonna go to, let's go to, let's go to China. <laughs> We looked at the paper. We made about $45,000. And um, we instantly, you know, everybody just demoralized. Like, wow. You know, people telling us, well, you know, you should come talk to me so we can invest some money and this and that. I'm like, hold up, man. They got our money. And we ain't the only ones. We had a, I had a conversation with Fat Joe about this about two weeks ago. And the education that's there, the miseducation that's there is killing a lot of money that can happen um, for us um, to help fuel some of the economic struggles that we have. However, we have no power base to help us go get the money. We have no, um, you know, no, no united front to go help. You know, in the case of Mims, I had to go out, you know, and to be real, most rappers, most people don't want to go through the struggle. Even the guy for the record label, we, when we confronted him about it on a conference call, he said, wait, wait, you guys, you're not, you're not rap, you're not rock managers. You're not rock managers. Like, okay, so basically, rock artists, they'll, they'll go fight for their royalties. We, we ain't trying to fight. I mean, me, Mims, and my man Eric are. But my point is, we need to shine a light on a few things. This is the music business. That's just one of the many businesses. The same, uh, uh, Battles happening in the clothing business. People are looking at statements, and you know, and it and it gets smart because what they do is they put a, a, a certain uh, uh, what you call it when you got a time in a contract. They have certain uh, uh, yeah, you have to yeah, you got you got to handle these things within a certain time period. So we miss out, and, and what I'm trying to get us to do again is to uh, unify on, and shine a light on something so that we can put it in the media and have our kids yeah. see us unifying for something, because I think that's the biggest thing. We, we really don't stand, we stand for things individually, but not together. So I, I'm gonna just leave it at that. Well, before we continue, I wanna, Reverend Jackson, you, you, oh, got a phone call, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. If, if I'm at, I, you know, man, I wanted to speak to education, but you just made it such a dynamic point that I don't wanna override his point. But, but what I wanted to say about education is the word education comes from a Latin word, adducere. And the, the, the literal meaning of adducere is to bring out. So the process of education is about tapping into a young person and bringing out what's already there. When I, I attended Wagner College, I was studying to uh, have English major as well, but I took an education course. And my professor told us that the process of education K through 12 is to make good consumers. That's it. You don't really get good education until you leave uh, 12th grade and hopefully go on to college or some other. Education is an everyday experience. It's about understanding your personal value, tapping into it, and then creating a system where we monetize our value 
and then we account on ourselves to feed ourselves. You don't have to worry about somebody being in your pocket because it's you in your pocket. Um, and, and that's a part of, I think, the goal of what real education is. It's not about a training or sending. A good friend of mine says, we send our children to a plantation and then worry, wonder why a slave comes home. Education happens in your home. The Hasidic community, I have a lot of respect for the Hasidic community because they don't ask nobody for nothing. And I think we have to occupy ourselves understand our value and learn how to monetize it ourselves, And then again, you know, we don't have to worry about people in our pocket. Well, uh, my microphone died, but I would love to introduce the Reverend Jesse Jackson. <laughs> Introducing the Reverend Jesse Jackson on this hip hop power panel. Thank you for having us. Could you speak on this? No. <laughs> How's everybody? I am a, uh, Delighted to be a part of this session. I admire so much the hip hop spirit as we evolve from just singing, which is a great talent, and just dancing, which is a great talent, to find our own, our product, which is the ultimate proposition. I said to a group down in a few minutes ago as we keep, and when we meet like this, we start thinking, when we get creative, our minds start clicking. Uh, in, in slavery time, when the, when the commodities exchange was started on Wall Street, we were the commodity that was exchanged. That's why you have the African burial ground down where the, down at the trade center now. Because we were the commodity. Long before cotton trader got to Mississippi, it was New York landed, we landed right here first. But during that season, watch this, more valuable than banks or insurance, was an African who was traded. We were the number one commodity uh, with exchange rate uh, in the country. And during that time, the big industry, of course, was cotton. If you get the open field, you, you plow the ground, you remove the grass, you plant the seed, you grow the cotton, you remove the weeds, and then you pick it. That's the real hard work. From that point on, the all of the plantation gets paid. The man at the gin gets paid. The lawyer gets paid. The one to make the sacks you put the cotton in get paid. You turn cotton into yarn and they get paid. You get to New York and you start trading clothes and selling it across the water, they get paid. Everybody got paid but the cotton picker. It was illegal for the one who drove the industry to get any direct benefit from his or her work. I'm going somewhere with this. Alabama plays LSU in the big game. The coach could get $4 million. Athletic director could get paid. Uh, school get paid. Television get paid. Advertisers get paid. But the player gets caught selling a jersey, he'd be kicked out of school. They, they, they just won your scholarships. So you go from picking cotton balls to picking footballs. You are not move except laterally. You are not moved up the ladder. Can I get a witness to somebody? But now, let's take it a step beyond that. It's not only that they've not figured out some way to pay those who generate what they create a fair wage. If Camelo gets a hundred million dollar contract, for example. And they say, invest your money on wise, don't just spend your money on, on hamburger stands, don't just spend your money, you know, buying bars, you know, spend your money, don't just buy a lot of extra cars, be wise. And I say, well, I look at, I'm filling up, uh, I'm filling up the uh, Madison Square Garden, I think I'll invest in myself. So rather than give me a hundred, let me take 50 million of my money and, and invest in the Knicks. It's illegal. You mean the people who fill up the stadium cannot invest in themselves? Y'all with me so far? So cotton balls, you, you drive the industry, but you can't get paid. In college, you generate the revenue. Illegal to sell a jersey and put you out of school and embarrass you. In the pros, you get your money, and there's something that you can't invest, which is in yourself. Now, I, I, we're still together here. We're in the same room. 
So as we think these thoughts of economic reconstruction, it's not the talent that sets the game, it's the rule maker. Those who set the rules determine the outcome of the game. We must fight that fight. The second thing I want to hear today is that yesterday, uh, the governor of Alabama, of uh, Arizona, put a thing in the president's face. Yes, he did. Now, y'all, look here. That's right close to spitting, you know. Mm -hmm. um, one man calls him a liar. He goes on and raises $2 million that weekend. Uh, another challenge his, his birthright, Donald Trump. He keeps grinning, chilling at our, at our events. and don't get booed. Then somebody's challenged, he's not a Muslim, he's a Christian, he's a Muslim, challenged religion. Uh, food, game which goes around, you're a food stamp president. All these, you are not one of us, they're meaning. Now, to take you to the next, she does, in front of cameras, pure theater. Yes. She was showing up, she was making her political point. She's gaining fans and votes at the expense of his nose. Now, you know she picked the right one to put the thing in the face. You, you do understand the president got good manners. Some of us don't. We don't, we don't have them kind of manners. She'd be, she'd have four fingers a day or something. It'd be, it'd be an interesting, no been interesting kind of theater. So I, here's what I want y'all to do. You're using your, your social media. I want you, I want us to fill up the email down in Arizona, plus boycott. Aura Benson, that's our press sector. Aura Benson, R B E N S L. Aura Benson at Arizona.gov, Aura Benson, R B E N S L, Arizona at Aura Benson at Arizona.gov, 602-542-1342. Aura Benson, R B E N S L at Arizona.gov, 602-542, this telephone number. One three four two. Now, I say that as a project because there's some things that unite us, right? There's some common action that transcend my stuff. This should be one of those points. That we should fill up this email and get ready to ask people that we know we're about to have a, a convention in Arizona until she apologizes. Go another way, because you do know six weeks ago they shot an AK-47 in the White House. Yeah. Oh yes, they did. They were 800 yards away and it bounced off the window because it was a bulletproof window. But if somebody had been on the balcony, they'd have been hit. I mean, do not underestimate how ugly and violent take our country back. This is, this is war. And, and really, this is a civil war. The very action of, of Tenth Amendment, of the right for states to control people and determine who and who cannot vote and under what conditions. This is this is the worst, this is the Tenth Amendment, they rationalized slavery. So, well, we have the right to own people. This is our sovereign state. The right to segregate, this is our state. The government had to intervene to say the federal government is sovereign, not the state. The, the king victims are over states' rights by getting the government to intervene, which they called interposition and nullification. So they resented deeply being the government in intervening the break up segregation as we knew it, or the break up denying the right to vote as we knew it, or the right of women to vote as we knew it. So please connect on that. Um, so we should continue on with this discussion. Um, what the Reverend just talked about was uh, empowerment. Um, I know he spoke, if, spoke about it from an athletic standpoint, but I think that <clears throat> the same could be um, discussed with our artists. Uh, one thing I wanted to note, and this didn't come out, but a few years ago, Suge Knight, Jay Prince, and I believe, and Irv Gotti got together and wanted to start a distribution company. For those that know, distribution at that time was where the real money was. The distribution of music into stores, into uh, bodegas, wherever um, the music was sold. And, Shortly thereafter, we bore witness to the dismantling of Death Row, the dismantling of um, Irv Gotti's company, the Inc. Records, and, uh, and an attempt to really dismantle Jay Prince as well uh, and his Rap-A-Lot records. I wanted to get the panel's opinion on this notion of empowerment and what the real struggle is. Um, and I might add that, you know, for example, Irv Gotti, 
um, everything that they were charged with was false. It was all wrong, but the fees to defend themselves crippled the company. Um, Jay Prince, on the other hand, had very strong political and street connects. I don't know if street connects helped him, but his connection to Maxine Waters definitely helped. And um, and uh, and you know we all know what happened with Suge Knight. So I wanted to you know get from the panel this, a sense of what true power looks like and how do you get there without becoming squashed. Well, Kwai's has kept in the music business probably the most powerful company. Not only because they've got, uh, they're making a tremendous amount of money, but because they the way their deal is structured. This company actually owns their masters. It's sort of like a, a um, best kept secret. A lot of people don't know this, and I'm talking about Cash Money Records. Cash Money Records has a distribution deal with Universal. And what that basically means is that um, Universal Records only gets a percentage of the profit to distribute the records, which is to put them in the stores and do the online distribution. Cash Money owns all of their masters. Um, all of them. Can you so, speak to what that means? Well, at the end of the day, record industry, uh, record labels are in the business of acquiring masters, right? And the masters are the actual um, the physical embodiment of the records. And um, they have a value long past their little, you know, uh, period of time where they have a hit, you know, six weeks, whatever, you got a hit record. Because when the internet hit and there was all this internet, uh, download, uh, uh, internet piracy, what kept a lot of the labels going was the fact that they had catalog that they could sell. You know, so you had the Beatles catalogs, you had, you know, the best of the Jacksons, all those, all that kind of stuff, right? That's 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 the lifeblood that's kept the record industry uh, alive until they've kind of gotten a little bit more of a handle on this internet uh, uh, distribution model now. And um, you know, when you're an artist and you enter into the recording agreement and you go in the studio, you make your records. Um, the argument can be made that the label is advancing you money to make the record, so uh, there's an investment that there that the, um, is involved, but. Once they've gotten their investment back, you don't get the masters back. So they continue to be able to um, uh, uh, exploit those masters, uh, derive all the revenue, and then they're paying you a very small percentage of it. Um, going back to um, what Corey was saying, or CL was saying about, you know, that you sell all these records and it's a, it's a, it's a battle to get money. Uh, I represent a couple of clients that are just basically having, having to sue the labels or actually auditing them to try to get some of their, their music back. So, you know, a lot of people, you know, don't really recognize the fact that, you know, Def Jam and his heyday didn't own their masters. Um, Uptown Records didn't own their masters, but you have Cash Plain that, that, that owns their masters. So, from that perspective, um, you know, one of the things that you want to do moving forward if you're an artist or you're, you're, you're a label is you want to maintain ownership of your masters. Um, or at the very least, partner up where you are a 50-50 co-owner of the masters of the labels. Um, and that's where the true power is. To some degree, you know, the, you know, uh, uh, rap a lot and de death row, whatever, not coming together and creating a distribution arm probably was a, a smart thing at the end of the day because, you know, the traditional retail distribution model is dead. So um, that would have been a, a very prudent investment at this point. So. You know, when, at this point, it's controlling your master is really where the power is. Um, you're able to license it for use in commercials and movies and all that kind of stuff. That's where a lot of money is. Um, and so, again, to my knowledge, at this point, Cash Money is probably the only label that, the major, la major label that been able to control their masters. Um, master P is the man. Master P was my first example of someone going in and owning their master from New Orleans once again or through New Orleans. But back to identifying value of self. When you look at Master P, you look at Cash Money in the 90s, New York wasn't hearing them. New York was not, they could not get a record played in New York to save their life. And because they had no impact in New York media, the major labels based in New York wasn't trying to hear them. But through their fortitude and perseverance, Master P said, I know what I got is crack, and I'm going to the streets with my crack myself. So he went back to New Orleans, and he just distributed in his region. 
He made the relationships with the local mom and pop stores, the local the independent one stops who distributed music. He had those relationships and he was selling hundreds of thousands of records himself with no major push, no major promotion. Once you start selling 75, 85,000 records yourself, Warner Brothers, Interscope, they're gonna find out, because they're checking the, wait a minute, what is this group down here in New Orleans selling all this music? We need a meeting. Master P went and did the first deal, like what Bob just mentioned, with Priority, and the cash money coming from the same region. Universal said, you know what? We're gonna take our cues from Priority, we're gonna play their game. And that's how they were able to help free us. New Yorkers, we lazy. You know, we got the record label lay. I could just run up on Ralph and I could run up on CL. Hey, yo, what's up, Chuck? I need to put me on. No, we got to go back in, do the work, understand our value, connect with people that look like us and think like us. Then we create a power movement. Now, to answer your question, if they really want you, they come in to get you. Nobody's safe. If they really, really want you, they coming to get you. And if you don't lay down, if you don't get down, you gonna lay down. Now I'm talking serious business. Read the book Hitman, an excellent history of the music industry and how uh, crime and the criminal subculture has kind of controlled the music industry for a long time. Now to that I would say, if you live foul, expect foul consequences. So what happened to the three gentlemen he mentioned? I'm not passing any judgment. I don't know them personally. But ah, <laughs> certain things happen to certain people. Other people don't have those issues because they move with a certain spirit. Like I've never heard Ralph McDaniels getting ran up on. Like he's been doing parties for 30 years. And I never, I can't ever think of a time when you were broadcasting from a party and had to shut the camera down because somebody was wilding out. I don't really, because the spirit that he carries, the energy, Ralph McDaniels, Uncle Ralph, Video Music Box, the people come and it's love, it's community, it's support. KRS One don't have these problems. Chuck D don't have these problems. So when you write with yourself and you walk in the right spirit, you can do anything you want to do and God is going to hold you down. Um, I would like to add to a few things that the two panelists were saying. Definitely you need to own your masters. Um, and to elaborate just a small segment, he's a lawyer, he's an attorney, I'm not that in depth in knowledge, but it's basically you want the right to do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it with your music because it's yours. Speaking from a record executive standpoint, and to give some knowledge again of some, some of how this business works, as a producer trying to sell tracks and uh, get music placed, I've had placements with uh, Genuine, R. Kelly, I've worked with Tyrese, I've worked with Karis One, I've worked with a, a lot of notable artists and, and done material for them. And as a producer, not being on the inside or signed with the production company, it's hard to get a placement. I'm just gonna try to bring a history real quick to get to the point and answer the question. Um, I got signed to a, a production group called Trackmasters. They had an artist called Red Cafe. Red Cafe said, you know what? I want to do 13 songs on my album. So being signed <coughs> to Trackmasters, they said, we're going to do six. We were able to get um, become a part of that team and that system. So they said, okay, well, we're going to give y'all guys four. So that's 10 tracks already there. So you have three tracks left for the outside producing world to try to make this project. So you got Swiss Beats, the common producer, the up and coming producer, and those type of politics are prevalent within the music game, and it's a, and it's a, a, you know, a very big element. It's how you get signed, um, you have to know someone. Also, um, to again kind of answer the question, I think that they should have started that distribution company because it's us preserving us. We need to go to people that look like us, that understands what what we understand, I come from the culture of where we come from, rather than going to a corporation that really doesn't understand it and they just want to make a dollar of it. Now we lose the value. So if, you know, they being gentlemen that made it, some of them I know personally and, you know, we've talked about this situation, um, you go through bumps, bumps and bruises and 
they, they went through a lot trying to create that idea, but it's something that should be done to this day. We should own and control everything we do. Um, to expound on what Hakeem said, he said the Hasidic community, they don't ask anybody for anything. That's what we should do. If we're making the music, why you don't have, why we don't own our own record labels and put out our own music? It's kind of like almost if you make hot dogs, why don't you have hot dog bun? Why don't you make ketchup? Things of that nature. So, again, I think that... Um, they, right. <laughs> can, I, can I just say, um, until 1967, black folks did not receive welfare, and we were doing fine. We had a long way to go. Use the mic. I'll, I'll even give you one big, just, just to touch on what they were saying that we did own. James Brown was an artist that owned his own radio station. So he would put out records and play his records on his radio station. Sam Cooke, too. Sam Cooke, as well. So this is the... If you want them. So this Percy is Sutton. Percy, Percy Sutton. Sutton. So this is some of and, and Prince. Prince. This is some of the the mentality that we have to have as that ninety nine percent. Again, I, I'm I'm a music producer. I stress it a lot because I've worked with so many artists and I've started a children's brand. It's called Hey Young World because I'm a father and it was something that came to me when I started to see the music change. It started to get real vulgar, it was very nasty, and I stopped letting my children listen to the radio. So, you know, at first I wanted to chase that money, yeah, talk about all uh, the, the bees and the hoes and sell all the drugs you could sell, kill all the people you could kill on this record, because I wanted to check. But then I started to see how it was affecting my children and the money no longer became important. So I said, I need to do something, I can't just say it, so I started you know, something called Hey Young World, in which um, we tell positive messages to children five to 12, uh, in which they could apply in their everyday lives. And that's what it's exactly about. Nobody could tell me what to do. It's a positive message. I put it out. Um, I connect with other like-minded people. And that's where our mentality needs to be. We need to do business with people that look like us, that think like us, that come from where we come from, so that we could progress and become positive. And we don't need a system to tell us or control us what to do when we know it's right. That's what. Okay. So, definitely, definitely. We're, we're running low on time. I mean, I really want to get the audience included, uh, involved rather, in the um, dialogue and to ask some questions. Um, if you could line up maybe in the middle here, that way we, we only have one microphone at this point, so we can pass the mic in true hip hop form. This was dying too? Okay. And um, please, I, I urge you to have a question. A question would be awesome if you could have a question and a, if you do have a comment to make it very to the point. Brief comments, but we really would like questions. So we'll start with this gentleman right here. Oh, and if you could direct it to a particular individual, that would be excellent. My name is Harvey Butler and uh, I love hip hop. Um, I don't perhaps carry the motif of a typical hip hop cat, but I'm a bed -Stuy cat. Um, I went to Ohio State. I brought hip hop with me in 1981 as a DJ. Um, made a little money with that. Went on to get my MBA in finance. Worked for major Wall Street bank heading up minority business development so that I could help black folk, brown folk, own businesses. So when you look at the black enterprise top 100 businesses, I've helped put most of them down with contracts from Kodak, Nabisco, and J.P. Morgan Chase. Okay, so here's my opportunity for you cats. You guys are brilliant. You guys are brilliant. The, the, what people say about hip hop, you are antithetical to what people think hip hop is about, That's right. right? You guys are brilliant, you got an aspiring PhD. I'm sure most of y'all, if not all of y'all, got some college education or bachelor's or master's or whatever. This is an opportunity for us to converge hip hop and the black professionals that are out here who love hip hop. We need to work together because we don't see y'all. I don't see y'all, y'all don't see me. Right? But I'm out doing deals with cats. The number one, well, I, I don't want to put them out there, but I work with the largest black businesses in the I'll country. Cut you off. So here's, I got two opportunities for you. One, 
Hip Hop University. So anybody who wants to get down with me to talk about that, I'm, I'm with you. Teaching kids science, technology, engineering, and math. Making sure that we create the next generation of scientists, technology, mathematicians, and, and use hip hop as a means to help push that. That's number one. Uh, number two, I'm a Broadway producer. So I'm down with Stickfly. And tonight is a special Stickfly performance, 40% off. If you go to the box office, and if you come to me, I'll give you the code for it. I need your card for that, but I need you. Last that. point. All right. I want to do the first hip hop musical on Broadway, and I want somebody to help me with that. All right. There's a brother by the name of Gabriel Asheru Ben who created a curriculum called HELP, Hip Hop Education Literacy Program. Um, you can check him out at edlyrics.com, edlyrics.com, which is educationallyrics.com. And what he does is take the content from the rap albums and creates literacy exercises for them. He has like 30 different um, workbooks. The curriculum meets all federal and state guidelines as it has to do with literacy being taught in the public school system. It is phenomenal, and I think that's just a start in the direction of building math, science, uh, literacy curriculums using hip hop. Yep. Hey, I just want to connect after. I think this is what it's all about. You know, I come here just like anybody else. I learned as I'm sitting up here um, talking. So. I, I, I'm just looking to, uh, first of all, thank y'all, every, everybody for me, number one, but like Chuck said, let's connect after, let's, you know, let's connect. Chop it up, chop it up. I am Queen Mother Dr. Deloise Blakely. I am the community mayor of Harlem. I am also the ambassador of Goodwill to Africa. Uh, KRS-One named me Queen Mother of Hip Hop. 2010, the World Festival of Black Arts and Culture, which I carry in Senegal, West Africa. Ambassador of Goodwill to Fesman, the World Festival of Black Arts and Culture. What I'm going to ask you both, based on what I've heard, and I want your feedback on that from where you sit, as what you said was very profound today, and I was very moved and that's why I stayed in the room with you. What role do you see the mother of civilization, as Reverend Jesse Jackson spoke of, the greatest crime committed against the people is the enslaved experience on Wall Street, the first commodity sold how do you see us with your culture, because the culture is the spirit of a people, that take us back through the middle passage of the transatlantic ocean for a healing, a spiritual connecting, for a culture and our DNA to reclaim Gory Island? <laughs> uh, all right, so hip hop is nothing new. All right, we call it hip hop, but hip hop is what's been with us since we first came out of the, the womb of Africa. Okay, um, whether it's Africa, whether it's America, whether it's Asia, it's indigenous culture. The word Indian doesn't come from India, it comes from indigenous. And all indigo colored people are indigenous to the planet. And we all have our birthplace from one mother in Africa, okay? So until we get that right, and we get the plight of all indigenous people right, we are gonna do it all wrong. Right now I got a sister out in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Her name is Yanajaha Lone Wolf. She's half Lakota. She's a Sioux. This weekend she's trying to use hip hop to raise her people there. We need to unite. Black, brown, red, all indigenous people and poor white people for the rights of beings on the planet Earth. And hip hop is our birthright given to us from our mother. So if we tap into our mother, she ain't gonna fail us. Mm -hmm. I might add my esteemed colleague here, Chandra Sims from All Hip Hop, noted that there were no 
women on the panel. So next time we will make sure there are some females That's representing. Even though the organizer is yes. female, she didn't represent. I have a reason. Why? Because hip-hop is very top heavy with men. So it's very, hip-hop is, and I, and I and I did put my myself on the panel because I wanted somebody to say that because hip hop is very top heavy with a lot of men. And so when I reached out to people, to women, and first of all, it's only a few women that can have this conversation. And I don't want to be, I don't want to say, well, I'm one of the only women that can have this conversation, but there's very few women that, um, that can have this conversation. And while this is the representation of hip hop, if we look at it, you know, across the board. So women, we have to change this. We have to be the catalyst to say, oh, why is that all a man panel? I did it on purpose. Because I wanted somebody to say, where are the women? And so when you look at hip hop, where are the women? And what are we doing when we are out there? But I, but I made that very clear. And I raised that in the conscience of the male child, the male children, by saying the mother, mm -hmm. the mother of hip hop. So the inclusion, they cannot without the mother birthing. An African Lombardi can tell you that, Cool Hurt can tell you that. So the mother energy must always inject in the culture and the spirituality of any culture of a people. So that is our statement and it's profound. We are there, because we birthed you. I'm gonna shout my mother out right here. <laughs> Since you're all mothers. <laughs> Please, please, I need a brief okay, question. Stop the I'll tell everybody else. I have like one minute on this mic right now. Um, honestly, I'm Natasha Green. I'm a teacher at Dewey Clinton High School. I'm a lot of other things, but I'm not coming to you for that. My question is, I am a dean of discipline, and I deal with the students who could watch YouTube and word for word just say everything Little Wayne says or say everything, you know, Drake says, or whoever. So my question to you, me as a teacher, what resources or where should I go to try to tap into them being into that, besides help, but then also like pulling people into my community, my school community, like, and not charging us one, two, three grands because right now schools just don't have it. But I'm willing to set stuff up, I'm willing to do a lot of stuff on my end, and I have like 4,000 students in my school. You know? Well, I want to say something. Well, real quick, I before you go, I want to say something real brief. I, along with Chandra Sims here, we started a, um, an organization called City for Change, and we do just what you're speaking on, and we, thank, thankfully, with all hip hop, have the ability to sort of leverage a lot of these artists who will come out, and we can perhaps get together because we have these artists already talking to kids, and uh, particularly kids quote unquote at risk kids, but we should definitely talk. So I'll leave the rest to the panel, but we're doing things like that already. One, at least I know, I can speak for myself and I'm sure for my colleagues here that we're always available to come and speak at schools. I speak at a lot of schools and, you know, just to help, you know, give back whatever information I have. But also kind of keep in mind though, I know you're thinking about a lot of the bigger named artists, you know, to try to come, if you're not, just be aware that there's, there's a, um, sort of a, a phenomenon that's happening now where you have these sort of like, I call them internet superstars, yeah. you know, that aren't, they're not signed to major labels yet, or, uh, but they've got their own movements, and your kids know who they are, and you can reach out to them, and they'll come out, like I represent a client named Mickey Fax, like, he's ridiculous, so he, he, I'm sure you tell him, contact me if you want him to come and speak, and he's a very intelligent young man, by the way, so he could definitely, you know, help you in any way you want. And I think that also that young people, when you go to these schools, I just did, uh, I was at August Martin High School in Queens. And um, and young people, when you go in, it was like a career day. And so it was myself, I was the hip hop guy, and there was someone else from uh, a judge and some other people and, you know, maybe five or six of us. And August Martin called me back and said, you know, we got the best response from you, Ralph, you know. And nobody in the panel knew who I was. None of the other people knew who I was. And I said, because I talk in their language, you know, I come in, I'm talking to them in their language and I'm talking to them and, and throwing out little codes that they can understand. And so that's what hip hop does. We've been doing that for 30, 40 years. 
just throwing out those codes and all of a sudden we key in on it and that's what hip hop is all about. So if you get the right people, there are people that do this all the time. You know, it may not be the people that you think are gonna be related to your, your, your students, but we know how to talk to them. You know, we know the things that they wanna hear and we know how to get them reciting what we're talking about and the positive stuff, not necessarily the negative stuff that they might see on YouTube. All right, reach out, thank you so much. I'm sorry. I was just gonna say one other thing too. Just the other thing you gotta do is you gotta really listen to the music that yeah. they're listening to. You really have to take your time to listen to some of it. You can't be like, uh, whatever. You gotta really understand it, right? There's an artist named J. Cole that's just out, right? So everybody's been talking about him, whatever, whatever, right? So I got a chance to listen to this album, like, I, and I really listen. And for example, he's got a record where, and you have, it's gotta be age appropriate because it's not for all the young kids, little, but he's got a record where he's talking about abortion. He, he, he's picking both sides of the issue from a male perspective, the woman's pregnant, and so he's talking about it from a male's perspective, and then he has a female's perspective. Like, those are the kind of records, in my opinion, that, you know, are fodder for a conversation with young people or younger adolescent people, because they're listening to the record. So you could listen, you should know this, and then be able to sit down and have a conversation and say, well, what does this mean? You know, and kind of educate, and use that to educate, for example, about te teenage pregnancy, that kind of thing. Thank you. Yes, I'm St. Joe Ronde with Ronde Media. I represent Caribbean Life. Have you given any thought about creating like a hip hop city in the Boogie Dale Bronx where hip hop came from, where you have a place where you can have living, health, do the business, have attorneys and all that, and this way you could capitalize on what you want to do and protect it? And I'm willing to help any which way I can because I'm launching a TV network March 14th, my birthday. So I'm at your arson. I can make it happen for you. It's still up for sale? I, I, they sold it? I thought they averted that. No, 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 it's still. Make sure everybody can hear you. Uh, 1520 Sedgwick, which is where Cool Herc lived and kind of where hip hop got its start. Um, at one point, I know they were either selling it or they were trying to figure out what to do with it. And it came back up um, a couple months ago. I was in a conversation with Dr. Shaka Zulu, who works with BAM trying to figure out ways of rescuing that building, that property, so hip hop could take advantage of it. I don't understand why someone say like a Jay-Z or a Diddy or someone of that sort wouldn't just, it's, Jay-Z is from the 80s. I think, you know, kind of like, you know, kind of like moving a record, like moving ideas. That's something that we can touch down with the people and create enough momentum where we can force a Diddy and a Jay-Z to be a part of it, a 50 to be a part of it, because it, then it makes sense for them to be a part of it. So we might not need them right now. We got to do some groundwork on our, on our level. Yo, this your boy Computer. I'm here in the, in the words of my company, Gangline Entertainment. Um, go to college, it's a beautiful thing. I'm here for the hip-hop cause. I'm doing clean hip-hop, profanity-free. I want to shout out to my manager, my mother, Kalia Camacho Ali, who's the wife of Muhammad Ali, my late great cousin, Smoking Joe Frazier, and we're doing some big things. We got a vitamin water coming out called Lion of the Ring Water. Uh, shout out to Muhammad Ali. He's going to be working with us on the, um, on the uh, project. Okay. And um, we're doing it big, man. We're coming here in the name of hip hop. And we're bringing some positivity back to the game, man, and leading the people where they need to be led and do this the right way and learn how to keep the money within our communities and learn the, the, the business aspect for us ourselves. You know what I mean? And stop letting the label heads control our music. And let's have some more control of our music and be more responsible for, with the, for the things and the, the, the message we send out to the kids. Because whatever we send out to the kids, they're going to mimic us. So if we give a positive and a strong outlook on what we're doing, that's what the kids is going to get, that's what they're going to pick up. But if we give them a negative outlook, they're going to pick up on negative. So let's keep hip hop alive and keep things like this going on. Your boy Computer, Gangline International, man. Uh, We're here at the so uh, we Occupy Hip Hop, work, the Hip Hop Union, right up here in Sheridan Towers in New York. Um, got my man, Nutri Sweet over here. Right. We're we don't have to like initiate this. Really, it's well, about young like folks. Well, like I said, my you know I mean? I'm my, you know my mean? cousin Computer. Exactly. So it's about and, uh, the 13 year old, 20 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 year old
and then having them in turn. I'm happy with you. So what we really need to do is when you're in the streets, on the subway, on the bus, you see young folks doing what young folks do, don't be afraid to talk to them. So you think the hip hop business is getting fair share? Engage in the conversation, get their mind thinking about other things. They'll come up with the same. Actually, it has been king differently. The one thing I do see that, um, that I'm very really upset is um, a lot of people that's getting these deals on this um, has been jerked around, especially by these, these, these companies. And at the end, they have to take a whole lot of money and be locked on the contracts. And, uh, that's not how hip hop is supposed to be. It's actually supposed to be about love and culture. Because it comes from the people. It comes from us. And yes, we do like to make money. But, uh, but you know, we, we made hip hop for the love of it. And, uh, I just hope in the near future all that will change through education and knowledge. Those back we're here today at Occupy Hip Hop at the Sheridan Towers Hotel in New York City. The conversation has been great today about basically business and misrepresentation of hip hop and not getting a fair share. There's all types of business here. I mean, with us today is Motasha Spearman. Uh, she is actually uh, from a Million Ideas. And uh, they have some amazing stuff that's going on, and I think we all need to know uh, what this young lady is talking about. So tell us a little bit about it. Uh, Chameleon ID is a biometric device card system. Did I make a good system? Um, my brother, Fred Smith, is the owner of the patent for Chameleon ID. Um, it is a multifaceted capability card device and a system. I would welcome you to go to chameleonid.com. There you will find a personal information. It is very, very user friendly. Again, this card. This techni technology will change life as we know it. Security unsurpassable. Please take a look. Take a look. Now, is this security based upon like internet or it protects our credit card or personal? It, it protects your credit card. It has to do with encryption. Um, a patent on the card is the fact that it has a, card, a magnet stripe and a chip attached to the card. Made, uh, making it virtually impossible to hack. You heard a lot about um, people yeah. hacking just, you know, they yeah. can walk right by you with different devices, so therefore you have to put aluminum foil over your wallets, or either they actually have aluminum wallets now. Chameleon ID, again, the security that, that it entails makes it virtually impossible to breach your personal identification. I think you guys need to go to the internet and use the shop besides music videos and you hear with us. Rock by hip hop because we stress that. So uh, give them that website again. Yes, it's chameleonid.com. C H A M E L E O N ID.com. Again, C H A M E L E O N ID.com. Visit the web. If not now, when? So if not us, then who? If the technology is there, visit the web. Let's make this happen. Support those that support you. Like the house. Exactly. And connecting with the hip hop, uh, the hip hop entertainment industry has been very, very interesting. And I look forward to connecting with you. I pledge allegiance to the life of hip hop. And to my heart, for which it beats, I am one mind moving together, seeking respect and empowerment for all. And we say, are you in? And you say, I am. Are you in? I am. So now, everybody just took an affirmation to do something about what we heard today. It is very hard to bring hip hop together because we all think that we have the answer. Okay? But we have to, we do all have the answers. We each have an answer and we each have to add something to the fire and to that. Everybody has to give a contribution. It's no one person. Hip hop has controlled the world right now. So one person cannot do it all. Okay? So everybody again, I just want to give a round of applause to this wonderful panel. And every, I want you all to give a round of applause to everybody. Thank you everybody. Hi, my name is Adam Clayton Paul IV and I am a citizen of hip hop. I thank you for being here, Hip Hop Union. Today we've had a great, great panel, uh, Hip Hop Power Panel. It's part of the 15th Annual 
Wall Street Project Economic Summit. We discussed a great deal of ideas, thoughts, uh, solutions, and, and indeed uh, networks that people are doing in uh, positive thinking, that people are doing in a, it's a great thing. We need to become the ambassadors of hip-hop goodwill, if you will. Uh, throughout the nation because what you've seen here in this uh, room today in this hip-hop power panel is very dynamic, very powerful. My name is Chuck Kriegler and I am a citizen of hip-hop. As far as the, as as the hip-hop union is concerned, I really feel that we need a national database of some sort that really galvanizes all the different grassroots movements, the grassroots players, the activists, the artists, the business people, so that we can have a central location where people can access each other, network with each other in an online and online environment, and will allow us to really network in a way that sustains the movement, the Occupy movement, in a way that materializes for generations to come. I'm the Dr. Bob Lee from 107.5 WBLS, your number one source for R&B, and I am a citizen of hip hop. I'm the Dr. Bob Lee from 107.5 WBLS. You know, we started way back with Mr. Magic and all that stuff, the Rap Attack. We used to go around with the WBLS Juice Mobiles promoting the show, and we were the first radio station to play hip hop in New York City. As a matter of fact, I wrote a, a rap for Frankie Crocker back in the day. He read it on the air as a poem. That's how early that was. As far as uh, Occupy Hip Hop, the people in the, uh, in the audience, they're very receptive. They're very right there on, on top of things. Our audience was like on the money. The panel was on the money. Everybody had a great time at Occupy Hip Hop. I hope we can do it again and talk about uh, some more of the issues. We spoke about hip hop health, H H H. Nobody steals the idea, but we're talking about it right now. Let's see if we get some health care and some insurance for people uh, who started the hip hop back in the days and people today too. So we're working on that. Let's see if we can get that started. It's an idea. Let's get it on and pop. My name is Hakeem Green. I am a citizen of hip hop culture. Yeah. I thought today's panel was awesome. I think we had some very intelligent people who participated. We came with some um, phenomenal ideas and experiences. Um, I think we need more of this type of dialogue. Um, I think we need more answers to come out of this. And I think we need young people who maybe don't have the historic background, but who have the vision of future ahead of them to tell us what direction hip hop should go in. So all in all, today's event was magnificent. I'm glad I was a part of it. I am hip hop. Going on, it's your boy Alize, and I am a hip hop citizen. I think and I believe today no, 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 no. great success we were able to come together with like-minded people. We were able to get some good ideas going and um, share some other good ideas and give a good point of view from everybody. I think it takes a, a, a village to raise a child, that type of principle, mentality, and uh, we, we explored it and we implemented it today. I feel today was a success and I'm looking to uh, be a part of many of them. I'm Ralph McDaniels, I'm a citizen of hip hop. Here we are at the uh, Bush Rainbow 15th anniversary uh, conference. We're doing it up crazy. This is how it goes down. And if you know anything about hip hop, you know who I am. Twitter me at Video Music Box. You can hit me up and we'll find out a little bit more about it and what we're doing. But uh, we want to make a difference. Get involved. Find out about what hip hop is. Find out about all the elements of hip hop. I'm not just talking about rap music. I'm talking about all the elements of hip hop. And then once you find out what hip hop is all about, and figure out what fits for you, make a pitch, make a pitch of what you might want to get involved in. And get involved. If it's music, if it's art, if it's fashion, if it's, if it's, if it's whatever it is, if it's the style, if it's clothing, whatever it is, you get involved in it and you participate in what this is all about. I am a citizen of hip hop. My name is Ralph McDaniel. It's Uncle Ralph, all right? At Video Music Box. Hi, my name is Bob Celeste, and I am a citizen of hip hop. And I think that this organization needs to move further into education and outreach. Uh, the more education our citizens have, the greater they will be able to deal with uh, any of the developments that occur in hip hop. Uh, and as far as uh, this panel is concerned, it was very interesting. I've met a lot of interesting people, and I like the interaction between the, the panelists and the audience. It is a lot of great ideas to kind of build up on the momentum and take hip hop to the next level. I am a citizen of hip hop. What's happening, world? 
My name is CL, and I am a citizen of hip hop. Well, I'll tell you, um, I love what's going on as far as it being a hip hop, anything that's representing uh, a light line, so positivity, I'm with that automatically. Um, I feel like right now, where we need to be as far as the hip hop, first of all, I feel we have to find an issue to really attack. Um, and my personal issue right now is to fight against for uh, equality, I should say, uh, amongst the record companies and artists being paid. Um, I say that because uh, hip hop artists in particular who are signed to major uh, labels uh, are somewhat in a, in a place where they're being taken advantage of and not reaping 100% of the royalties that they are going to do. I had spoken with a panel about a case that we're dealing with for an artist who very successful in the name Mims, who signed Capital, in my Capital for uh, I think about three, four years and uh, had a number one record. Uh, and at the time, gross roughly $14, $15 million. Dollars. Uh, for the company. Uh, we were a part of a joint venture to another joint venture, so we were roughly entitled to 25% of the net profits. Broken down, uh, we ended up getting about maybe $150,000 uh, total. And um, the quality I'm talking about uh, is just a basic right. I'm talking about people who worked hard for their, their companies, for their partners, uh, and just did not receive the benefit uh, of so. And I don't know how people may want to calculate that math, uh, but uh, it just came out very wrong. So we had to go hire our own uh, forensic coordinator. Uh, we had to go hire attorneys. And we're in the midst of a legal fight now. And, and what's most important, what I'm trying to get at, is that there are many other artists out here that are dealing with the same issue. We don't have a power base to fight um, corporations with. And this isn't just music. Music is just our platform. Um, those artists that were entrepreneurs and got into business in the fashion world, film world, um, you know, this fight is a, a, a big fight just for equality. I'm not asking for anybody, I don't think should get paid more than they deserve, but I do believe people should get paid what they deserve. It. Ironically, our auditor found over a million dollars that they had couldn't account for. I still can't. We are in the midst of a legal fight now, but you know, the hip hop union, uh, you know, that is where, you know, those are the things that we should be standing up for. Because it's basic right of equality. It's not anything uh, that's far fetched. Uh, it's stuff that money right now is tight for everybody. Um, on top of work. But you know what? If it's old, you gotta pay it out. And that money can be used to fuel ideas, start other businesses, and give other people to keep this economy moving. So that's really what I'm, I, I, I'm all about. I feel like the hip hop really is in a position to actually support uh, these types of efforts. So that's my speech. My name is CL, and I represent DigiWax Media Worldwide. My name is Rob Wilson and I am a citizen of hip hop. And what the hip hop union should be doing from now on is stressing entrepreneurship and education because it's those two things that are going to allow ourselves to empower our own communities in the future.